real poverty is now slipping back into our lives. Welfare states wither under the pressure of inflation, which is targeted on those without assets, and so understated in official measures. Governments are less and less able to meet their obligations through taxation, yet are afraid to reduce these obligations and resort to dangerous levels of inflationary borrowing instead. Devalued educational qualifications guarantee nothing. Job security vanishes. Pensions become unaffordable. Governments, while refusing to admit this is what they are doing and either claiming that the migrants are refugees or pretending to try to control migration, or both, encourage mass movement of people to create cheap labour to keep wages low and leave their indigenous poor to cope with the resulting strain on housing, education, health care, transport and social services. But in my country, this is an even bigger problem. My country also encourages immigration because without it, much of the unskilled work of our society would simply not be done. Listen to this list of British government mistakes. An egalitarian dogma which has destroyed education for the poor. A welfare system that refuses to distinguish between the deserving and the undeserving. De facto legalisation of marijuana. The abandonment of any controls on alcohol. A selfist destruction of lifelong marriage, fatherhood and family life. Just a few examples. There are others I could come up with given time. These have produced a huge new layer of ill-educated and tragically unemployable people who cannot reasonably be expected to do any work. And they do not. And those migrants who do the cheap labour are, as always, pitiable in their exploited ignorance. But many of them are also amazed in my country at the strange inability and unwillingness of local young men and women to do the work they have come to do. And by the inability of the host country to enforce its borders and its migration rules. I've observed this. I know it to be true. It has happened to Britain. It may have happened to you, but it certainly has happened to Britain. It's in the past. It's not about to happen. You may protest against it in Britain if you wish, but it will do you no good. And the Christian has another problem. He absolutely must do what he or she can to try to make this mess work. We didn't choose this. I think it was a grave mistake. But it would be a still graver mistake to do anything which might make it worse. This is one of the problems with Christianity. Its adherents are quite simply prevented from taking certain sorts of political actions, especially any which might reasonably be expected to lead to cruelty or persecution. The people who have come among us are here. We must be kind to them. But the Liberals and the Open Borders Neoconservatives are not pleased with or happy to apply the necessary second half of this proposition. This is yours and mine, Europe as a whole, a Christian society from its foundations up. Though, as I pointed out earlier, it will only remain so for a short while as things are. Those who come to live in it should be expected to accept this in practice. Like any other guest in another's house, they should adapt to the rules of the house, not demand that the house changes its rules to suit them. But alas, the terrible problem of our age then reappears. Our societies are attractive to migrants and agreeable in many ways because they used to be Christian. They will continue to be so for a few years yet, as Christian habits of thought take some time to die out. So, the migrants, paradoxically, have come here for benefits which their own arrival, unless they are encouraged to integrate, will help to dilute and destroy. But who will encourage them to integrate? Our governments no longer believe in any of the principles on which our societies are based. They believe instead in a subjective and largely meaningless thing called human rights. Old-fashioned Political conservatism in European and American societies has almost completely disappeared. It has been replaced by an aggressive Thatcherism or Reaganism, always indifferent to and often quite hostile 
to the marriage-based deferred gratification morality of social conservatism. Among the strongest supporters, for instance, of marijuana decriminalization in Britain is a body called the Adam Smith Institute, which dares to name itself after that great economist. It is crammed with keen young Thatcherites. It constantly produces material calling for the legalization of marijuana. I have renamed it the Adam Spliff Institute. <laughs> and it has not been particularly unhappy with this renaming. The Cato Institute in the United States takes a similar view of this particular aspect of selfism or libertarianism as this strand of thought boastfully and in my view moronically calls itself. Many of those, and in this I, I rather include the Murdoch media who claim to be disturbed by the arrival of large numbers of Muslims in our midst, are also keen supporters of the open borders which this libertarianism favours. The backers of anti-extremist school programmes, of powerful secret police, of overpowering security services to track terrorists, the friends of the surveillance and identity card state, are the same people as the ones who say that they want open borders. Worse yet, they are the same as the ones who have repeatedly supported crazed wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya and Syria, which have stimulated so much of the movement of people which we now face. Then there is the very strange transformation of the left, a left to which I used to belong. Old-fashioned social democrats were often highly socially conservative, because so were their voters. And their voters were highly socially conservative because they knew very well the value of social conservatism for a good life and an honest place if you weren't rich enough to buy your way out of crime and trouble and chaos. They were in favour of marriage, of disciplined education, of properly enforced laws. Who suffers worst from disorder and crime? The working poor, of course. They were often straightforwardly patriotic and almost invariably suspicious of large-scale immigration. Who speaks for them now? In Britain, much of the Labour Party began among Methodists, Christians, very serious Christians, who followed the social gospel of the same John Wesley I mentioned earlier. Yet there is now absolutely no sign of this once huge political force in the British Parliament. Only a last faint echo of it in the large Labour vote for leaving the European Union at our referendum last year, which actually swung the result. The old Marxist left have become Euro-communists, cultural revolutionaries, uninterested in the working class and reconciled to the continued existence of capital, provided they can regulate it. Capital, in turn, is uninterested in conservatism and is happy to cooperate in political correctness of all kinds, which suits its desire for an unlimited supply of cheap and pliable labour. How shall we in the West now compete with the sweatshops of Shanghai and Canton? Why? By driving mothers out of the home and into the workforce, and by flinging wide our borders to all who come, so that we too can have sweatshops here in Copenhagen. And in London, too. Meanwhile, China has proved once and for all that you can have prosperity and economic growth of a kind without political and intellectual freedom. The great hope of the 1990s at the end of Chinese communism and the arrival of prosperity and capitalism in that country would bring freedom has been one of the most totally broken of our times. Is all this because we have tacitly accepted that the future will look far more like China, a country which, for some reason, few yet have come around to fearing, that than it will look like America, of which we increasingly despair? Is it possible that we spend so much energy on attacking repression in Russia, a country we are not truly afraid of, if we have any sense, and which is no real threat to us, but serves as a useful bogeyman into which to deflect our shame at bowing to the real menaces of China and Saudi Arabia. I sometimes wonder whether this is the reason for this curious form of madness. 
In many ways, the new world before us looks worryingly like the weird joint child of Margaret Thatcher, Timothy Leary, and Deng Xiaoping. Its loins free, its economy liberated, while its drugged mind is set on passivity and pleasure and regulated by internet conformism. It all begins to resemble Aldous Huxley's brave new world, the most accurate dystopian prediction of them all, far surpassing Orwell. Who needs thought police when people have come to love their own servitude? In this century, the philosophers have so far changed the world. Now, it seems to me, the point is to understand it. I have sought this evening to explain how my own preoccupations with the abolition of history, the destruction of religion, the use of legal and illegal drugs to create passivity, the failure of conservatism to combat or reverse cultural and moral revolution, the crises of interventionist war and mass immigration, have a common thread. I am, however, too lucky. I was privileged to see the end of the previous civilization. I am not uncritical of it, and I know very well that it is dead and gone. The past will not come back. But I also know that it possessed virtues which have entirely vanished from the world we now live in. And it is perhaps because I can see no way of restoring those virtues that, like Rod Dreher, I feel forced by my own thoughts into a retreat from combat. I can easily imagine finding some island or mountain fastness and hiding there until the storms are over, trying to keep a feeble flame of enlightenment alive. To fight the monsters and dragons of the new world, you need a belief, not just that the present is all wrong, I can help you with that, but that the future might be better. And in that, I'm afraid I have to leave you entirely on your own. Thank you.